So let's summarize Unit 9. As usual, I'll begin with a topical summary of what we covered in this unit, and then speak a little bit more broadly and generally about the key themes and ideas. So this unit was on pattern formation. I began by pointing out that we've seen that dynamical systems are capable of exhibiting chaos. That's unpredictable, aperiodic behavior, butterfly effect. But there's a lot more to the story. Dynamical systems can do much more than produce chaos or disorder. They can also produce patterns, structure, organization, and so on. And in this unit, we looked at one particular example of a pattern-forming dynamical system, a class of systems known as reaction diffusion systems. So first we talked about diffusion, and I tried actually to demonstrate it by dropping a few drops of food coloring in um, a glass of water. Diffusion is just the tendency of a substance to spread out as a result of random motion. So the random ink molecules or food coloring molecules, they bounce around and eventually they'll spread themselves out evenly throughout the um, glass of water. Another way to say this is that chemicals tend to move from regions of high concentration to low concentration. And the net result of this is that diffusion tends to smooth out any differences in concentration, leading to a homogeneous or uniform distribution of the food coloring or whatever it is that's diffusing. So diffusion is described mathematically by the diffusion equation. Here it is. In this equation, D is the diffusion constant. It's related to how fast the substance diffuses. Different substances will diffuse at different rates in different media. Often this is something one could measure experimentally. This is the rate of change of concentration. And this is the Laplacian. This is a um, certain type of spatial derivative of the system. So I should say that U here is the concentration of a chemical and it's a function of x and y. We might have, say on this sheet of paper, different concentrations at different points on the page. So in um, any event, this describes the um, diffusion of substances once you know D and in the initial conditions. In the, the equilibrium state, when this stops changing, if I set this equal to zero, then I'm uh, in effect setting this quantity equal to zero, and that has the effect of picking out the most boring function possible. It'll just be a flat level distribution if the boundary conditions allow it. If there's more, say, there's some chemicals flowing in on this side and out on this side, one would just get a smooth distribution and interpolation between those two values. So again, the main point is that diffusion leads to um, boring functions, functions that are as homogeneous as possible. All right, but things get more interesting in reaction diffusion systems. So in this, we now have two different types of chemicals, often called U and V or A and B. Um, the details may vary. And uh, U will be the concentration of one chemical as a function of X and Y, so different concentrations at different points in space. Same story for V. And both of these chemicals diffuse, they spread out across the surface, but they also interact with each other. So their equation, the equation of motion, what determines their values, the rule, the dynamical system, are these two equations. So this is just diffusion for U, but then this says there's something, some added term that's an interaction typically between U and V. So it's diffusion plus something else that depends on U and V. Same thing for the V equation. V will diffuse, plus there's some other interaction, a different interaction, a function G, of, uh, but it's a function of U and V. So it's diffusion plus something else. This is a, a deterministic dynamical system. There's no element of chance. There's no stochasticity in the rules. And it's a, uh, it's a spatially extended dynamical system. So if we give the initial condition, initial values of U and V everywhere in the lattice, or uh, the rectangle, it doesn't have to be a lattice, and we specify what the conditions are at the edges, then that determines the, um, the future values everywhere on, say, this piece of paper. 
Another point that's important is that this rule is local. And let me explain what I mean by that. This use of local is not an entirely standard one, but I think it's, it's justified. The idea is that if I want to determine, say, the next value of u, so I know the present value of u and v at some particular point on, uh, on, on our surface. If I want to figure out the next value using something like Euler's method, all I need to know is the value of u here, the value of v here, and then the derivatives of u and v also at this point. So what I mean by local is I don't, if I want to know the next value of u, how u changes at this point, I don't need to know the value of u over here. So that these equations are all local and that they're, in any given equation, x and y is constant. It, it, it keeps reference to the same point. So um, again, maybe another way to say this is there aren't any long-range interactions here. Um, the next value of u is determined by the present value of u, and just a, it's a, a little bit about its curvature given by the Laplacian at that point. So we have a local deterministic spatially extended dynamical system. So in reaction diffusion systems, or uh, specifically um, activator inhibitor systems, the following setup typically is the case. Um, U is usually an activator. It's something that catalyzes its own growth. So the presence of U gives rise to more U. So uh, rabbit growth, growing exponentially growing rabbits are an example of this. Rabbits, we don't usually talk about rabbits catalyzing their own growth, but in a sense that's what they do. V is some sort of an inhibitor. It's something that typically would also grow in the presence of U, but it would also inhibit U. So it prevents U from growing too much. And in the example I gave, these were foxes. Foxes grow in the presence of U. Foxes eat rabbits, so uh, there get to be more foxes, but, they, but the foxes inhibit the rabbits. They, they prevent them from growing and growing. So if we have these two things and that V diffuses faster than U, this can lead to stable spatial structures. And we saw some examples of that. I'll show you one again in a second. The particular shapes determined depend on a number of different things. The relative diffusion rates, how much faster one diffuses than the other, and also the geometry of the system, and in some sense the initial values as well. And of course, it would also depend on the particular functions you choose for U, uh, excuse me, for F and G. And there are lots of different possibilities, and one can do three components, U and V and W. So um, there are lots of different models here. And the mathematics of analyzing them analytically gets pretty complex pretty quickly. But in the additional reading section for this uh, unit, I um, have some suggestions for places you can go to learn more. OK, so these are reaction diffusion systems, one particular type of them. Here's um, some results. We experimented with the um, excellent program at Experimentarium Digital. Um, here's the URL. There's a link to this um, on the links to program page. And this was the um, Guaypa setting, so this makes cheetah spots. There, there it is. That doesn't quite doesn't show up that well in black and white. It's a more compelling picture on the screen. And um, here, the diffusion rate of U is 3.5. That might be hard to see. And B was 16. And that program specifies what the F and G functions are as well. But the main point is that even though we have a diffusive system where things should be spreading out, it shouldn't, you should, wouldn't expect to have a higher density of, say, U here than here and have that be a permanent situation. It should diffuse away. That's what diffusion does. It smooths things out. But um, if we have reaction diffusion systems where things interact in the way I described, one can get a variety of different stable spatial structures. So these uh, systems form patterns stable spatial structures, sort of seemingly um, out of nowhere. This isn't just a mathematical result. There are lots of physical systems that do this. Um, I showed a little bit of a video of a belusov zabotinsky experiment taking a place on a Petri dish. Here's a link to that YouTube video. This link is also in the additional resources section. This video is by Stephen Morris of the University of Toronto, who we'll be talking to next week. So um, this looks a little different than the cheetah spots, but it's the same general thing. Reaction diffusion, we get these um, sort of propagating wave fronts that move out, and then the wave fronts collide with each other and interact in interesting ways. 
All right, so to summarize once more, pattern formation. There's more to the study of dynamical systems than just chaos, lots more. Um, it's very often the case that simple spatially extended dynamical systems with local rules, like these reaction diffusion systems, are capable of producing stable global patterns and structures. And this begins to give some insight into how patterns might emerge in um, an otherwise structureless world. The reaction diffusion systems that we studied here are just one of many, many examples of pattern forming systems. There are lots of different classes of models. Um, the partial differential equations of reaction diffusion systems is just one of them. But um, in general, there, there's a certain creativity to these simple dynamical systems that can not only produce chaos, but can also produce these interesting structures.